Gender-based violence. Why are states so bad at making it stop? Maybe it has to do with the money they get for perpetuating it. This week, in her first appearance since fleeing Brazil, a woman's rights advocate speaks, and we talk with activists and philanthropists about what works and what doesn't when it comes to stopping violence against women and girls. That's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Gender-based violence happens everywhere. It undermines the health, dignity, security, and autonomy of its victims. It knows no social, economic, or national limits. Violence against women and girls and anyone perceived as vulnerable on the basis of their gender is as old as the hills. Even as year after year, decade after decade, governments and non-governmental organizations alike pledge to stop it. Is it possible that a lot of well-funded efforts just don't work? Might they even be counterproductive? It's possible. But as they say, there is hope. Somehow, against all odds, some of the most vulnerable people in the world are doing some pretty effective work. Here to talk about the problem and the possible solutions are Kavita and Ramdas. After years of foundation work, as well as activism, she knows the world of philanthropy from the inside and out. She currently heads up the Women's Rights Program at the Open Society Foundations. Terry McGovern directs the Program on Global Health Justice and Governance at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. She's just back from a fact-finding visit to Beirut. Deborah Denise is Deputy Director of the Rights and Justice Unit for the International Planned Parenthood Federation, Western Hemisphere Region. She was recently driven into exile after receiving death threats in her home in Brazil. Thank you all for coming in, and I particularly appreciate you, Deborah, for being willing to talk on the program. Um, just to clarify for people, why did you leave Brazil? What are you up against? When did it start? And what was the nature of the threats that you've been facing? To understand what is happening with me, we need to understand who is the new president of Brazil. So Bolsonaro is his name and in and, and place since last January. And when we talk about Trump, we need to think that Trump is Bolsonaro from the South. It's the other way around. So he made his career making misogynists, racist, and against human rights defenders. So it was just a matter of time that I was in the center of a human rights issue to decriminalize abortion in Brazil. Abortion is against the law, women go to jail, and I was in leading a movement to change the legislation at the Supreme Court. So it was a coincidence last year when he started his race to the presidency and they started to send me death threats. So to put a point on it, you happen to be working on this work of decriminalizing as the Bolsonaro campaign is heating up. Yeah. Yes. So death it threats start coming. So I, I'm described as the first exiled person from Brazil, <laughs> but my point is that it's just the number one because human rights, it's at the center of his battle. Mm -hmm. It's a cultural battle against democracy, and there is a core agenda that is anti-women, anti-gender, anti-LGBT populations. So in my case, I had this sensitive issue from many people that is abortion, but I mean, it's not putting women in jail, it's about that in the South. Mm -hmm. And I was leading that case, so I, I was, a face in the public And space. what was the nature of the threats, if you don't mind me asking, and who did they come from? Yeah, it's really scary, because it was against me, my husband, my family, and they, they didn't stop. So even not being in Brazil anymore, I keep receiving them. And 
it's a mix of concrete description of how they will kill me, my parents, my brothers, my sisters, my husband, but also I would say in a language just saying, I know where you are working now. Mm -hmm. when we know where you live now. Mm -hmm. So at the same time that you can say, it's just to put you in fear. Mm -hmm. It's just to paralyze you. Mm -hmm. It's just to stop doing what you do. It's something concrete. It's mass shooting at the university where I use it to work. So how to handle that balance that is considering that something serious here, but it's not stopping, but not paralyzing. Did you have qualms about coming on the show? I consulted the police before coming here. I consulted a group of lawyers. And it's the first time that I'm speaking in public about that. You have a hypothesis, Terry, about why violence on the basis of gender continues to be both so rampant, so deadly, and at the same time, so funded, kind of. Talk about it a little bit. And what took you to Beirut? So um, first I want to say that it's uh, just thank you for having us. But also I just want to express incredible respect for Deborah. I, uh, you find people like her all throughout the world working on gender-based violence. So uh, although we're going to say a lot of kind of complex, difficult things, there's also incredible hope. Um, in in these these women all throughout the world and girls who are doing this work, so th you are a big example of that. So, I think that you know patriarchy <laughs> is very complicated. It's laws, it's culture, it's it's manipulation of all kinds of things, um, and there's been kind of a tendency from donors to kind of land on education is the answer or economic opportunity is the answer. Um, often, Those are the answers. Exactly. Often ignoring kind of the structural factors that are affecting women and girls. Um, so when you begin to look at what's being funded, first of all, if you're partnering, if you're funding through many governments, then you're not going to be funding efforts to change laws. Why so? Explain. But because the UN is basically their client is the is the government, right? So, so that makes it very difficult to do things that are, you know, going to be difficult for the government. So, so in many countries you have big problems with law, personal status law, religious law, and and it's it's at the core of kind of some of the issues that are going on. So if you just go in and and give the girl education or you just go in and, and, and give her a cash transfer. Um, or a micro <laughs> Right. You know, it's not fixing the larger set of issues. So I think there are some very courageous donors who are actually trying to get at this now and figure out how do we how do we how do we address complex interacting dynamics that produce gender based violence? Um, we haven't seen a, a de decrease. In fact it's worse and worse. So it is really important to look at what are we spending on? Why aren't we seeing changes? How do we empower people like Deborah on the ground who have amazing ideas? What is blocking them from getting resources? All right, so Kavita, you've worked in many of these foundations. You're working at another one now. Agree, disagree, add? Actually, I, I would distinguish um, foundations from the the biggest source of um, quote unquote aid internationally is um, not from foundations at all actually it comes from um, what we call bilateral or multilateral aid so it is government to government transfers or government to multi government institutions like the UN transfers mm -hmm. and those are much larger in terms of total amounts and actually there is where um, Terry's point about some indications of change. Most recently, the Dutch government made a series of investments in women's funds. Um, feminist funds and women's funds um, were created by women. The first one in the United States in 1972, the Ms. Foundation for Women by Gloria Steinem and others. Um, because, in fact, they saw that mainstream philanthropy was not putting money directly into the hands of small grassroots organizations. I worked for 14 years at the Global Fund for Women, 
And um, it also was created as a response to the fact that, in fact, many times the kinds of support that an ANIS, which is the organization Deborah leads in, uh, led and founded in, in Brazil, um, don't and can't absorb $50,000 or $250,000, but may need $10,000, may need $20,000, and may need it in ways that don't limit them from being able to use it in the ways that they think are important. So I think the first thing I'd say is that um, when you can recognize that the best way in which to um, get resources into the hands of activists on the ground is to actually use um, a much more democratic means of philanthropy, mm. of philanthropy than what we currently have, which is a very small number of primarily white men who have made fortunes through an extremely unjust and unequal economic system. Um, if they remain in control of those resources, then no matter how wonderful an individual program officer would be, and Terry and I both worked prior to this at the, at the Ford Foundation, um, we need to be able to work with allies and in I, a and I different hear you. vision. And, and of we that. believe in, in trickle up funds and trickle up justice and all of that. But what I'm hearing from you, Terry, and from you, Deborah, is if you don't address the superstructure in Correct. which these groups are working, you could do fantastic work, have fantastic funding, and still be driven out of the country by absolutely the death threats, right? So what would be your request? What, what, what might have made your situation different, Deborah? I think that we have to make a balance here. What is happening in Latin America in general, it's a kind of lab as a response for two things I would reduce here. One is a populist wave in the globe. It's not just here, yeah. but it's Latin America is a lab also cause of the response to the foundation's decisions in the last decade. When we heard that Latin America was not a priority to, to a global aid or to global philanthropy because we were in a good position. And Brazil was a key example of that. It's almost a continent mm -hmm. and we heard that we are not a priority anymore because they're a mid-level in country in development. And it's that, it's a response from inside. Mm -hmm. And we are in a region that with all respect to religions, we have a colonization of evangelicals and Catholics in power. So at the core of our discussion, connected to where the money goes, we need a discussion about democracy mm, and democratic I, I actually Absolutely. had a chance to interview the, oppo the opposition to Bolsonaro, who said the U.S. was not unconnected to the growth, especially of Pentecostal Absolutely. presence in Brazil. Um, you were just back from Beirut. Why? And why are you looking at Beirut and well, Lebanon and Tunisia as your two sort of so, tests. So that's study. actually just the place we're starting because we have a lot of work there already. I mean, just to say, you see the evangelical presence everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just want to not, I, I, you know, I, sure. I was just in Kenya and... But it doesn't just magically appear, I guess no, is the point. No, no, but I mean, it's... Uh, it's, it's, across, it's across India, yeah. it's in well, Haiti. It's, I mean, it is a huge and growing presence. And they're mobilizing on everything right not just you know against abortion they're mm -hmm. mobilizing against human rights democracy and what right. they call gender ideology Gen yeah so it's we did a show about just recently <laughs> yeah. right. um, so they will be there if you're so Beirut or Lebanon has a personal status law so women and girls they can't get divorced so how do you talk about a strategy around gender-based violence where you still don't have basic rights around control and that's an example where you know, there have been amazing campaigns and a lot of victories, but Lebanon right now is, has a Syrian refugee crisis. It's had a Palestinian refugee crisis. They're overrun with, talk about where is the money, they're overrun by the humanitarian sector coming in to study, uh, you know, or, or, or provide relief, but are they gonna provide safe abortions to women and girls who experience sexual violence? These issues are all so connected. Uh, you can't talk about gender-based violence and not talk about abortion, access to contraception, your rights to get divorced. So, your so, rights you know, in the workplace. Right, exactly. So, so I think, you know, obviously Beirut is a very interesting example, long history of activism. It is caught in this kind of global situation, this refugee crisis. It's overrun 
by some new donors who don't know anything about the context. So that's a really important point. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't say this works in this country and then slap it into another country. Yeah. You can't use a toolkit for gender-based violence that's going to work everywhere. And I think that's what some of the funding has been reduced to. Not all of it. You're absolutely yeah. right. There's yeah. brilliant small yeah. donors, but... I mean, you can I, see why people <laughs> say we have to just quickly do whatever it takes to get people out of immediate threat situation. If we have to work with the government to let, get those refugees into a safe place, we will. I mean, you can see why people take that approach. Of course, but I, I just want to go back to something Deborah mentioned about this kind of whole middle-income country nonsense, you know, which is this, which is a, which is a classic thing like, oh, now countries are in middle income status. We don't need to worry about them. We just fought and won, uh, we women's movements globally, uh, a battle that was fought in a middle to high income country, namely Ireland. The women's rights program at the Open Society Foundation was able to support the campaign for yes over a three year period with small grants to be able to help women organizing. Um, and Ireland is not a poor country, but we knew that actually if there wasn't support, and it was interesting because we really found ourselves the sole supporter of that work because so many people said, well, this is not Africa, this is not India, this is not, so, you know, but if that fight had not been fought, the repercussions for many Catholic countries all over the world and many non-Catholic countries would have been profound. And so, I think Deborah's point for us as certainly as private philanthropy um, to take a step back and to see that there may be opportunities in the so-called middle income countries to actually fight and win battles that actually have the potential then to have a huge impact in other parts of the world. And I, I hope more of us can begin to so step up around that. excellent point. Those. I mean, one of the things that occurs to me is most of these countries are not middle income women's countries. I mean, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> who's, do, who's getting this yes. middle income here? Yes. Uh, so go back to some of the models that are working. I mean, I'd love to hear from all of you, but you've just come back, Terry. Um, if you had your druthers, uh, what would you see philanthropy, aid, all of us do in a situation like this? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's just embrace complexity. Don't look for a single strategy, right? Don't just say, we're going we're gonna to focus on this. And then, because that's what happens in philanthropy. Two years right? on women. Right. Three years or on no, girls. No, we've decided it's economic opportunity. No, we've right. decided it's education. Right. No, we've decided it's cash transfers and everybody moves over to and that. Yeah. The and point being the <laughs> we've decided part? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a pile on when the big donors decide this is the strategy we're gonna follow. Yeah. Um, and I just think it's a mix of strategies for sure. And the point about it being tied to democracy is critical. Yeah, yeah but I, I would add, yeah. besides knowing that it's complexity, embracing questions that we do not have all the answers, but it's also questioning where the experts are based, mm -hmm. here or there. Mm. Yeah, so exactly. it's a feminist mm, shift that yes. we need in our philanthropy. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes you cannot even talk about gender. Some countries, you cannot talk about gender at the universities mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. They've been closing down gender studies programs. Can you imagine? Across Eastern Europe, across, it's really ironic, the, at the Open Society Foundations, the first women's rights program was funding gender studies programs in the former Soviet Union. Yeah. And now, many countries across Eastern Europe are closing down gender studies programs because they feel that it is um, promoting an anti-family ideology. Uh, one concern I have around the, the complexity, um, the, the unwillingness to embrace complexity, and I recently was talking to someone in um, the business world, you know, so now you see Coca-Cola and Pepsi and um, Unilever and Mo Exxon <laughs> Mobil and all these companies, they all want to quote unquote empower girls mm. and empower, sometimes empower girls and women. But I think the, the, the question around that is, when you, on the one hand, are paying workers a pittance yeah. in your for-profit company, and on the other hand, you're running a program to empower them, to teach them about being beaten up at home, women can see through that in a heartbeat. You know, you talk to the International Domestic Workers um, Federation, and they will tell you, where are the, all these 
companies to to stand up for decent wages yeah. for women. So that is also a form of violence, which I think we don't often. People like to think about violence in kind of very neat little boxes, and what they don't understand is there is economic violence being perpetrated yes. on and women don't, all the time. Gender washing won't fly. Yes. To come back, I'm thinking of oh. a wonderful mentor I had for many years, Vivian Stromberg, who was one of the founders of Madre. Yes. I know you're on the board, familiar with this organization <laughs> that worked with women in, in, in Central America during the period of the Central American Wars. She would say, yeah, we're stopping violence against women and girls. We're for empowerment. But sometimes on the ground, that meant digging a well yes. or helping of somebody course, yes. buy a That's truck. the complexity. Mm -hmm. um, so if we were to say, where, does your, where did that $50 go in the campaign against violence against women and girls, where would they put it? Yeah. Um, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yes, totally. I mean, the siloed kind of, it's, it's the, it's the, the standards emanating from the global north, frankly, is one issue. And then secondly, it's it's you know, it's gonna be a whole bunch of different areas that 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 need to be impacted, that are in play. Um, and they've been like, oh, well, that's humanitarian, and this is gender-based violence, and this is development, and that's human rights, and you know. It's just not working. So give us an example <laughs> from your most recent trip in terms of the innovations coming from the ground or the, the, the compromises and complexity of the work on the ground. Well, I mean, there's, there are amazing groups that want to really take on this personal status law. They, they need funding for a, for a flexible, resourceful campaign that, that takes from the work in Ireland, that looks at what has been successful. Um, there's, you know, they, they don't want to just work on early marriage or just work on, you know, the six things you can choose from. They actually want to figure it out as they go and have the flexibility and funding to amend the strategy mm -hmm. because, as you know, things are very dynamic. Yeah, and, and <laughs> I have a very good example also, and it was sponsored by Open Society and IPPF. When Zika and arrived, Planned yeah, Planned International Planned Parenthood Federation, the Western Hemisphere, where I'm now based. So when Zika, the epidemic of Zika virus, arrived in Latin America, it was, of course, at the center of the discussion, the mosquito, not the women. <laughs> so the mosquito. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was a big so mosquito and saying, risk. So we took some time to say we need to put women and girls at the center of our conversation. Yes. Because talking about reproductive <laughs> rights is talking about public health. So we need to reframe everything. But we need also to build an ecosystem mind mindset to change the way that we worked. Because if that woman decided to have the baby, you know, talking about choices, yeah. we need to make a connection with the disability movement. Yes. Or we need to talk exactly. about social protection. We need to talk about transportation. We need to talk about cash benefit transfer. And we need to talk about abortion. Yep. So different communities that traditionally do not talk to each other. Because those who sponsor disability groups, generally speaking, they are faith-based groups. Yep. So how to manage changing the way that we work with groups? So how do we manage, particularly in a media culture, which as you're saying all of this, I'm thinking this exact same problem exists in the media. <laughs> that we have niche coverage, women over here and children over here, disability right. over here. Mostly we talk about politicians, but not as they relate to any of those, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Laura, you'll be amused. I've been on a bit of a tear inside the foundation recently talking about how we think about intersectional gender justice. And I've been... Uh, told in a couple of meetings, oh, you're using jargon. And my polite response is, you know, we've been using the jargon of men for some 3,000 years now. <laughs> you can learn how to use the word intersectional. And this is all that it means. It means this, what we've been talking about, which is Audrey Lord put it beautifully. She said, we don't live single issue lives. So how could we have single issue movements? And I would add, how can we have single issue funding? It, it is not possible for those of us who have experienced life in communities to say that a woman who is experiencing a disease caused by a mosquito is not also a woman who is struggling with unfair wages or a woman who is not struggling with lack of access to health care or a woman who isn't struggling with perhaps intimate partner violence. Um, 
And I think it is when we stop being willing to hold that complexity, which Terry pointed out, that then we get into trouble. I mean, I was recently talking to Lydia Alpizar, who runs the um, uh, Association uh, Mesoamerican Initiative for Women Human Rights Defenders. And she gave a painful example of how mainstream human rights um, protection organizations failed to bring a gender lens to their work. So they had picked up a woman from Honduras um, to, to save her from the violence she was experiencing as a women human rights defender in Honduras. They picked her up and they took her to Spain with her family, but failed to realize that she was also a victim of mm. unbelievable violence. She was murdered by her husband two months after they arrived in Spain. Terry, we often ask people on the show, what will be the story the future tells of this moment? I think, uh, I think we are getting smarter and much more strategic. And if we allow, if we allow the women and girls at the country level uh, to lead, and, and we use our, our best brains, we can figure this out. But a key piece of it is the donor piece. Um, but there's many other pieces. So I think, again, um, I, always, I always feel a lot of hope, but things need to change. Fast. And yes. Terry, Deborah, Kavita, thank you all so much. You give me hope, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show. You can get more information at our website. That's lauraflanders.org. Thanks.